why do I think it is important to study the fighting arts? There's a lot of challenges in the life that we live. Nothing is easy in life, and I think many of us learn very early in life that failure is something that can destroy a person or it can teach them a lesson. I love the, I love the term winning or learning, as opposed to winning and losing. The fighting arts is a discipline that offers a fascinating pathway between the physical, uh, the mental, and the spiritual. And I think it's liking it to um, a pathway. It depends how far down the pathway you get uh, before it should become evident in the fighting arts that the destination is not truly the goal. It becomes the journey. And I think, if nothing else, that becomes an important outcome. The actual origin of karate is very uncertain and is still discussed today amongst many historians. Yet, many sources indicate that the motion of martial arts originate from India, which was brought over to China by a Buddhist monk known as Bodhidharma, or Daruma. The question of his contributions of karate and Buddhism in general has been a matter of large controversy among researchers for decades. However, his name does appear more often than most, and so he must have some large connection to the origin of karate. Legend has it that the evolution of karate began over a thousand years ago, some say as early as the 5th century BC, when Daruma came to the Chinese temple of Shaolin Si to teach Zen Buddhism. At that time, he also introduced a regulated set of exercises designed to build and strengthen the body and mind. Supposedly, these exercises marked the beginning of a Shaolin style of temple boxing in China. Eventually, Daruma's teachings became the basis of most Chinese martial arts. The term Karate Do originated from the Riku Islands in Okinawa, a small set of islands located just south of Japan and southwest of China. Many centuries ago, due to Okinawa's lack of natural resources, they often turned to the sea for necessities and trade. This led to the connection and contact of culture and resources from China and Japan. It was in 1349 when King Sato of the region Chuzan of Okinawa entered a mutual beneficial relationship with China where the people of his kingdom paid tribute to the Chinese by sending students, diplomats and merchants over to China as a gesture designed to solidify the relationship. In exchange, the Chinese sent their own merchants and diplomats to Chuzan. Soon after, in the 15th century, a wide variety of resources were exchanged between Okinawa and China, both economically and cultural. In this exchange, the Okinawans and Chuzan improved their economic status and began to adopt many Chinese social customs and cultural traditions. Later in 1422, King Shohashi ascended to the throne of Chuzan. Due to the central location of this region, all three regions of Okinawa became united under his rule. During this time, the King of Okinawa covered the country in a prohibition of the use of weapons. Because of this, and of increasing trade, Okinawa became a prosperous and peaceful island kingdom throughout the 14 and 1500s. During the 1600s, Okinawa's neighboring country, Japan, had just recently unified under the first Tokugawa shogun, Supreme General. However, this shogun still regarded the powerful feudal lord Daimyo from the Satsuma clan as a potential rival to his rule. To appease the clan of Satsuma, the shogun allowed them to wage a foreign military campaign and acquire the economic benefits of their conquest. This is what led to the 1609 invasion of Japan's Satsuma army into Okinawa. Okinawa was practically defenseless due to their weapon ban and so the Satsumas easily defeated the partially disarmed country. This resulted in Okinawa and the rest of the Reiku Islands under the command of the Satsuma and demolished Okinawa's label as an independent kingdom. 
This also led to the second weapons ban, which was stricter than the first. Despite all this, Satsuma allowed Okinawa to keep their king as a symbolic ruler for the people, allowing them to maintain cultural and economic contact with China. The development of karate started during this ban. Due to no legal weapons to defend themselves, the Okinawans resorted to empty hand combat brought over by the interchange of scholars and merchants between China and Okinawa. Outstanding young men from Okinawa's leading families were sent to Fosho, China, to study the ways of becoming a Confucian gentleman scholar. In addition, these scholars would learn and master Kempo, a Chinese martial art that translated to first law. After a minimum of three years, they returned to Okinawa where they would promote Chinese social customs and cultural traditions. They also began to secretly teach Kempo, which was referred to as Karate, Chinese hand, to selected members of Okinawan society. In the late 1860s, Japan's shogun started to fade out, and so in 1867, the young Mutsuhito inherited the throne and took the name Meiji, translated to enlightened rule. As the Meiji era began, the young emperor ended the political authority of shoguns and opened Japan's doors to the world. Mutsuhito also introduced a period of modernization and industrialization. Within just 30 years, Japan transformed from an isolated feudal state to the position of global economic and military power. Yet the fear of foreign cultural influences did not fade completely, and so the new government embarked on a program known as Kokutai, meaning national essence. The main objectives of this program were to enforce Japanese-ness, which was done by promoting cultural uniformity throughout all of Japan, including Okinawa, and by limiting foreign cultural and economic influences. This led to the demolishment of ties between Okinawa and China, and banning the use of any of their cultural activities, including the practice of karate. Due to the governmental ban of foreign influences, the teaching of karate was banned also. Consequently, this led to karate being taught in secret to specifically selected students who had applied and been accepted by a teacher. Up until the 20th century, a potential student had to be introduced to the karate teacher by a well-trusted individual and then had to request to train under his guidance. Eichi Miyazato explains that the common practice of the time was to keep the art veiled and hidden in secrecy. Teachers would bend students with violent intentions and traits and would refuse students with such tendencies who wished to join. When a candidate is accepted and is brought on as a student, he would first receive training in only the basics and would be required to perform chores around the dojo. The sensei would use this time to determine whether this individual has the potential to become a worthy student. Only if the student was seen to have a sound character would they be accepted by the sensei. In contrast, if the potential student would grow impatient and refuse chores and only basic techniques, the sensei would deny them into the dojo for further teachings, leaving them with incomplete instructions. Economic status also limited the number of karate students there were at the time. Only the nobility or those with enough money would be able to afford to be taught the martial art. As Charles Gooden explains, karate was something that only the rich could afford to learn. Commoners arose before dawn and toiled in the fields farming or on the sea fishing all day. There was no time for midnight karate lessons at a family tomb, nor was there any money for tuition. Gichin Funakoshi details his training experience during this time of secrecy. At the time, karate was banned by the government, so sessions had to take place in secret, and students were strictly forbidden by their teachers to discuss with anyone the fact that they were studying the art. Consequently, karate students and teachers would have to train and practice only when the sun set and before it rose again. It wasn't until 1926 that the veil of secrecy over karate was lifted. It was actually the military that first uncovered the fact that men were training in secret. It was when the Japanese army started recruiting men from Okinawa to grow their military when they found that several of the Okinawan men were substantially strong physically and mentally. Karate was then exposed. The Japanese government decided to end the ban on karate and use it to better train their military, allowing them to be mentally and physically fitter, built, more loyal, patient and patriotic. Soon after karate was released to the government and to the rest of Japan, the meaning behind karate changed from Chinese hand to empty hand, kara meaning both Chinese or empty. This enforced Japan's program of kokutai.
The style of Shotokan Karate was founded roughly a century ago by Gichin Funakoshi. Funakoshi was a dedicated man who possessed not only a passion for karate, but for calligraphy. In his calligraphy, he used the pen name Shoto, which he used to publish many books of poetry and his teachings and knowledge of karate. And so, as he built his experience and skills in karate and as an instructor, his style soon became known as Shotokan. It was Gichin Funakoshi who once said, The ultimate aim of karate lies not in the victory or defeat, but in the perfection of the character of its participants. As an established instructor, in 1922, Funakoshi moved from Okinawa to Tokyo, Japan, to present himself as a worldwide authority on karate and to introduce this martial art to first the people of Japan and then the world. In his early 70s, he managed to win an uphill battle to keep karate as an official and highly recognized form of martial arts in Japan. By the time of his passing in 1957, Shotokan karate was the highest regarding form of martial arts in the world, and it remains so today. Sports Karate Australia is a family oriented uh, karate organisation. We try to build people with their self esteem, but not in a way where they, they, they become bullies. We try to create a mentor system where people gain respect and self confidence from helping others. People build skills and earn respect. It's freely given, it's, it's earned, it's not demanded. Sports Karate Australia is, is more than a club. It, it is a family. It's somewhere to, to come and feel safe. It's somewhere to come and feel like you belong. And it's definitely a driving force in a lot of people's lives. Karate is a whole lot of different things. It's a place to come and be welcome. It's a place to be a family and it's a place to train and get fit, so it kind of covers everything. Well, karate is a good way to stay fit and healthy physically, and it's also, I think, a good way to learn techniques that have been around for a long time, <laughs> years and years. Um, so I started off with ADHD and this, all the slow movements and some other techniques helped me to control how I did things. Well, karate makes me a better person physically, obviously, by making me fitter, training, losing weight. Mentally, it gives me something that I've achieved, something that my goal, I've reached my goals in life. The goal of Sports Karate Australia is to improve people's lives, to give them self-confidence, physical strength, physical fitness and the ability to deal with everyday situations and unfortunately sometimes uh, threatening situations. We believe that a true warrior puts their family first, puts other people first and avoids conflict wherever possible. But when confronted with a threatening situation of violence that's unavoidable, is able to fight. How long does it take the average person to become a black belt? And of course, you know, the answer is an average person can never become a black belt because it takes such uncommon dedication and the willingness to accept the pain of discipline. The black belt needs to be a kind of bit of everything. You need to be a friend, you need to be firm on other people, be enforcing, but also empathetic at the same time. So you need to understand where people are coming from because people have done it for you as well. Persistence. Don't give up and a, and a strong character. Uh, definitely strong, strong of mind, strong of body. You have to put yourself in other people's shoes. Uh, you have to learn how other people learn uh, and how to approach people in, in different ways, uh, how to express yourself in different ways. So you need to now provide rather than just take. I think one of the good things about the fighting arts is that because we struggle with physical challenge, 
often more than we should. It's that attempt to overcome and be better than we were yesterday continually, which provides the lesson for contentment. We're always realizing that we're not perfect. And so the constant struggle, and particularly through physical violence, allows us to see the beauty of living a healthy and happy life.